Greetings, future fossils. This is Michael Garfield welcoming you to episode 176 of the Art and Philosophy podcast for a future weirder than any of us could have imagined. I'm doubling down on this particular iteration of the show description with this episode to help repopularize the original definition of the word weird, as in W-Y-R-D, as in twisted, like so many guests of Future Fossils. I tend to pitch my tent on the premise that things are weird because we see the self in what we understand as other, or the other in what we understand as the self. That there is a braiding together of categories and that this braiding strengthens our understanding in the way that braiding fiber makes rope. That the weird is not to be dismissed, but engaged tantrically, surrendered to, served and instantiated. Because the weird is precisely what we need now in our toolkit of adaptive strategies. When you're caught in a riptide, of a historical change, and you don't know which way is up, turn into the turn. I was caught in a riptide that killed a man once on the coast of Florida, and the teaching of those experiences is about how to make your way through an experience that is profoundly disorienting. Well, here we are, first quarter of the 21st century, a time when it seems Every stable and reliable understanding has liquefied and oozes now around our feet, swirling into bizarre new configurations. What better time than now to think about the turn, the post-human turn, the non-human turn, the introspective turn. And so it is with this in mind and with great pleasure in my heart that I get to share this week's conversation with you. This was a panel that I moderated at the third annual Psilocybin Summit, an event hosted by Daniel Shankin of TAM Integration, who was on Future Fossils a few episodes ago. This is a panel that I helped assemble and was thus granted the insane luxury of inviting my mentor and role model, Richard Doyle, English professor at Penn State, into a conversation about a term that he coined, ecodelia, a weird upgrade to psychedelia that emphasizes the way that what Charles Darwin called the tangled bank of evolutionary relationships manifests in the deformed subjectivity of the quote-unquote psychedelic experience. Richard joins Sophie Strand, author of The Flowering Wand, one of my favorite people to follow on Instagram for her luxurious and profound writing on psychedelics, myth, and identity. And Sam Gandy of Imperial College London, who is one of the few rare, wonderful creatures that actually gets to study psilocybin and the psychedelic experience in an academic setting. His work focuses on ecological experiences that people have under the influence of magic mushrooms. Before we dive into this extremely cool conversation, two things. One, I'm finally making a serious bid at turning future fossils into something that can pay me and my family a living wage. After the last few years of working full-time in the toxic and traumatizing environment of social media, I am desperately ready for a change and with your help i can start saying no to some of the other obligations in my life that have prevented me from doing more for the listening audience of this show i have a lot of projects in mind and a lot of conversations i really want to make time for and so this is a warning that by the end of the year the future fossils facebook group will become a patrons and legacy members only private group because I've realized through daily conversation with the folks in there that forum moderation, news curation, and community management 
represent to many of you an even greater value than the podcast itself. I'm honored to serve you in this way, and I'm going to continue doing it as best I can. I just need to stop giving it away for free. (laughs) So the Discord server, I think, is going to pivot into more of a project-based or collaborative enterprise. I've been posting job opportunities and uh, crypto news and other stuff in there, and it's my hope that we can cultivate that into a kind of a skunk works or X labs, not only for future fossils, but also for the entire network of podcasters and creators around this show. Let's do something amazing together. Come find me in there. And you can find a link to the Facebook group and the discord server in the show notes, which in case you haven't been looking at them tend to be rather extensive. Let me just pin this with a note of appreciation for all of the new people helping me escape my desk job over the last couple weeks on patreon.com slash Michael Garfield, including Paul Cousin, Sandra Wren, Bob Tajima, Shahab Hamad, Rex Washburn, JJ, John Maybe, Emmy Sorrell, Justin Vay, Trent Stevens. Wow, that was a good two weeks. Thanks again for helping me find the time to continue doing this work without having to court sponsors who don't understand, sell products I don't truly care about, etc. Let's just not do that. (laughs) Stay tuned. At the end of the episode, I'll give a short announcement about the next few weeks, what you can expect, and seriously, enjoy. I've been wanting to have Richard Doyle on the show since we started five years ago. Sophie Strand and Sam Gandy are amazing, fascinating people. I deeply enjoyed this. I hope you do too. Okay, hold on, hold on. Sophie had asked what your least favorite book that you actually read cover to cover. Right. And we're getting things like the Bible, Stranger in Their Own Land, uh, a Steven Pinker book by Richard Doyle. Not by Richard Doyle, was Richard Doyle's answer. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> there was a Sufi saint named Baba Mahayadeen. He was a wonderful, brilliant saint who came to America. And at some point, I, I was in a used bookstore and there was a bunch of his little tiny books and I got a couple of them. And one of them was really bad. <laughs> But the thing is, it wasn't his fault. It was the translator because some of the other books were like beautiful and flowery and profound. And this other one was just sort of left me flat. So through no fault of his own, that book was terrible. Welcome to the third annual Psilocybin Summit. (laughs) I'm really, really glad you're here. Today, we're going to be talking about exploring Ecodelia with Richard Doyle, who founded it, who coined the term, Sam Gandy, Michael Garfield, and Sophie Strand. And I'm going to make myself scarce in a moment and let Michael moderate and take it away. And I'm just really glad you're all here. Thank you, Richard, Sophie, Michael, and Sam. I really, really look forward to what you people have to say. And thank you, all of the attendees, for being with us here at the beginning of our third day. Uh, Much love to you all. Just there for a second to remind people that this is eventually out on the public feeds of a show I love and nurture. Wow. Okay. So I am so glad that this is happening. Uh, And, and, you know, Rich, I think in particular, I have been kind of afraid to get you on Future Fossils just because I find our communion so narrow and precise and vulnerable and deep. And it's hard for me to imagine like what having a conversation with you in public would be like, but okay, so here we are. And Sam, I don't really know you yet. And in fact, you haven't even, I'm, it says you're not muted, but you have made not a sound since you joined this call. It's unusual for me actually, but, um, but yeah, nice to make your cybernautical acquaintance. And Sophie, your wall is exactly what I hoped it would be. Yeah, unfortunately, this is not where I usually do this, but it's really hot in the rest of my apartment. So you see all my embarrassing stuff. Here I am. (laughs) 
No, I mean, it's, it's, it's perfect for a sort of a mythopoeic immersion. Yeah. So the other, the other question that we had, and maybe we won't get to this right away, but the other, the other sort of uh, catalytic question that we had was, what does it mean to you to be outside? But I think it makes sense for folks here just to introduce yourself briefly. And I guess we'll start with Rich, because this is your word. What does ecodelia mean to you? The fossil... It's not my word. It's a word that imposed itself upon me because I had had a set of experiences. I was engaging in an inquiry. I wanted to understand the drug war. And in wanting to understand the drug war, I'd ended up on a, a NPR uh, audio documentary about ayahuasca that was we were making back in 2002. And uh, while I thought that I was the uh, kind of you know, scholar in resonance for the show with my audio producer, I was turned inside out in the jungle and healed straight up of lifelong severe asthma, which much to my total astonishment. And I had already been researching the history of psychedelic science because I had become interested in ayahuasca, not for ayahuasca, but because I was interested as a historian of science into the history of the attempt to study human interaction with these plants and compounds. And I was particularly interested in their effect on language and the effect of language on them. And so, you know, I experimented with psychedelic as a word to describe what had occurred within me, uh, without me uh, in, in the jungle. And I know you got to cross that out. You know, it's like on house hunters when they say not that one. And uh, I, I tried uh, entheogen that, you know, beautiful formulation, new coinage by uh, uh, Carl Ruck and Albert Hoffman and Gordon Wasson and Jonathan Ott, I think. And at least at the time, that word, that, that stem, Theo, was a little bit undigestible to me. And I thought it begged as much of a question as it answered, whereas like they were pointing to the awakening of God within you, whereas I had been sort of pulled inside out and my experience of it was uh, when I was trying to say, okay, what is the action of these compounds and plants? Clearly, there's not just one nonspecific amplifier for human consciousness. I believe it was Stanislav Grof coined that. And I realized that it was that total dwindling of the difference between inside and outside, specifically in an ecosystemic context that I experienced not only, of course, in Peru, but in the woods of Pennsylvania on the regular, and that it was in that what we once would have called ego death, that I became aware of my radical interbeing with all living things in a way that I found more palpable than when I didn't use that word. When I used that word, it helped me remember that my apparent separate individualized being is in fact a manifestation of this larger biosphere within which I might thrive. And that by reminding myself of that, in fact, I started to live differently. And in fact, I started to heal, you know, to go to the etymology of that word, meaning to make whole. So it was really like a script, right? That I was like, not psychedelic, not entheogenic, didn't work for me. And ecodelic just sort of manifested for me and it worked for me. And because it worked for me, it's like it's like if you come up with a meditation and you want to share it, it doesn't mean I think, oh, that's what they're really called <laughs> or anything like that, or it's improper to call them anything else. Only that as a kind of uh, software for my inquiry, it really helped. And um, the book eventually got published back in 2011, but I'll just say and then be quiet that it's not coincidental that that word emerged as the call of the planet through climate change became something more than a conceptual experience for me. I knew about climate change and the challenge to our global ecosystems since I had done, you know, reports on it in the seventies in like fifth grade uh, or read something uh, in Reader's Digest when I was 12 that predicted there would be no plants in Japan by the year 2000, right? Uh, and uh, so thanks, Reader's Digest. But that I felt within me the pull that we had to begin a response 
to this materialist mechanistic perspective on the earth. And it wasn't simply a conceptual response. And the reason I say that is that it was difficult for me to get into a car for more than seven years. And I rode my bike everywhere in a, in a quasi pathological fashion because that, <laughs> that, that ecodelic experience made me tremble and feel horror before the globalized late capitalist prison industrial complex that we were living in. Now I've learned a little bit more to do what they call integrate or maybe what they call sell out. You decide. <laughs> I'll take the car once a week, you know? So that's why ecodelic. Ecodelic was almost like, you know, the, the Coranderas who work with Wachuma, the cactus down in uh, Peru, they, they build a mesa, right? They have a table of objects that allow them to better navigate the experience that they're um, presiding over creating. And my medium tends to be words. So I was playing with words to try to tune the experiences that I was having. And I began to notice that there were feedback loops between the words that I used to describe the experiences that I was having. And I discovered that John Lilly had the same experience back in the 1960s when he discovered that if he imagined that the universe had an alien deity like the star maker before he got into the flotation tank and took 250 micrograms of LSD or whatnot, that it was a more interesting time than if he imagined there wasn't such a thing. So it's a purely experimental uh, script, but it's one that sometimes people pick up and work with. And I found that it keeps me tuned specifically to the plants that you can experience the plant, the presence and activities of plants in your everyday life in a different way. If you train yourself to focus your attention on that, obviously, right. You know, but just using little scripts to allow you to notice that you're caught up in an ecosystemic mesh is awfully healing. I have found. Sophia might take a while to unfurl your brow before you speak. Me? If you, if, yeah. Oh, no. My singing teacher, you always used to say, relax your face. And I was like, I can't. I'm thinking too hard. Um, <laughs> thank you for the word ecodelic, Richard. Um, I, I very much believe that words are spells and that yes. we need to create specific terms that decenter human narratives. And I, I think that Entheogen and a lot of those terms, unfortunately, reify a kind of subject-object relationship. And there's something about ecodelic that's much more in tune with Kieran Broad's term of space-time mattering, that we are entangled with co-creating, intra-acting with these substances, that they're acting on us, we're acting with and through them. So that's why that word has really resonated with me. One of my areas of study is Gnosticism, in particular, the movement from folkloric Canaanite religions to early Judaism to monotheism and Christianity. And something that really seems clear to me is that even in the Gnostic figure of Jesus, of Rabbi Yeshua, we see a kind of ecodelia as a human birthright, as something that actually is the fabric of reality, that we have to work very hard neurologically to gate out. And that culture is this kind of shuddering it's this kind of, cre it's a creating of a false reality. I think a Lacanian idea of reality as being this just agreed upon truth that actually takes a lot of mental work to contain and to homogenize every single day. So for me, I was very much interested in how Ecodelia fit into these Gnostic texts, that the kingdom for me is this Ecodelic experience where you realize that everything is extraordinarily animate everything is alive. And this can be both terrifying and also make your decision making that much more fraught with culpability. That every time, yeah, you get in a car and you turn your key, that is capillarying out to thousands and thousands of beings. So I think what I love most about this term is its plurality, its verbing, its, its gerund quality. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's just say one thing, but go ahead. Just that I went the exact same direction with the Bible, so I can't wait to hear more about that. Yeah, no, I, I really, um, 
I really like the word uh, ecodelic. It's cool to meet the uh, the source of it, Richard. I because I, my friend David Luca, I'm sure you know, has has wielded it before, and I kind of wonder where it uh, sort of came from. And so my background is is in ecology, my academic background, and my PhD. And ecology is the is the science of the interconnection and interdependency of of living systems. And and yeah, I've obviously, like got a lot of time for that. But I think what's interesting about something that's an ecodelic, like a psychedelic, is it's a different route to that same knowing, to that same realization of interconnectivity, of interdependency. And there's a big, big difference between having a kind of detached academic objective understanding of the interconnection of living systems and then have the direct felt experience of being connected and part of the the wider living system and i feel like this is something really important because one how one one's consideration of how ecodelic they are in other words how connected to nature they are is not only powerfully there's a lot of uh, scientific literature to show that's really important for your mental health and well-being particularly eudaimonic well-being which is sort of high level well-being beyond just hedonistic feeling good the pursuit of living a life of virtue the pursuit of excellence self-actualization is all, is all sort of falls under that umbrella but at the same time it's a key predictor perhaps the strongest psychological predictor of pro-nature pro-environmental behavior and attitudes and i think this is a really interesting point because we've got so much scientific evidence now of the human influence on global climatic system on biodiversity loss on plastic uh, infiltration into all the, the oceanic terrestrial ecosystems we, we we know the evidence is very clear and ever building of the sort of scale of our human impact but it's it's not in on a local level there's there's pushback and there's positive action happening but it's not happening on the scale or at the speed it really needs to and there's this dissonance, there's this disconnection, like the cold, hard facts and the evidence are not enough to produce this behavioral change, this shift in consciousness that needs to happen. And that's because, yeah, at least with, with this whole idea of nature connectedness, this ecodelic connection, it's much more about a direct experiential, emotional felt connection. It's not a rational, knowledge-based, scientific evidence-based thing. So I feel like, yeah, things that can kind of promote this, this ecodelic perspective, which is the inherent bedrock, that is the central tenet, that is the truth, you know, living as separate beings that sort of look at nature as, a, as, a, as a, an extractive resource to be sculpted and fiddled with and pulled from how, how we see fit is, is we've, you know, we're the only species that wantonly destroys its own habitat. We are a mentally ill species in, in that sense. We're an ecologically mentally ill species. So potential interventions and substances and practices that can push back against that disconnection from nature and, and reignite our ecodelic knowing are very, very important at this time in, in uh, of our civilization on this planet. I'm glad that you took it there because something that preoccupies me on a daily basis is the sense of our conceptual models, be they verbal or, or mathematical, and the way that those models actually seem to be the software or the script, or the recipe or algorithm through which we uh, invoke or annihilate this boundary, right? And so to me, it seems that what we're really talking about when we talk about inside and outside in whatever sense is, I guess, for the sake of this conversation, it's not an ontological horizon. It's an epistemic horizon, right? It's the horizon determined by that which we are capable of considering. You know, I like the way that Eric Davis put it in his book, High Weirdness, that there's a sort of metabolic dimension to this and that, that by juicing up the brain that an ecodelic adjunct allows us to temporarily gain this ability to fold all of the economic externalities 
back into the model. I don't know if y'all are familiar with donut economics, you know, this, mm -hmm. this effort to try and close all material loops, mm -hmm. you know, to tie manufacturing and waste together, mm, you know, like because the there's this thing about it. Yeah. I, I, and I forgive this riff. Cause then I, I don't really have a question here, but I just want to riff on this for a minute and then toss it out to the rest of you and see what comes of it. Because, you know, when you say we're the only species that destroys its own habitat, I disagree. I mean, I think it's important, you know, what has happened for me in my ecodelic practice beyond simply just like actually taking drugs if you'll excuse the vulgarity is the understanding of the continuity and the the sort of the digestion or dissolution of human exceptionalism and so i look back to things like the great oxidation event of two billion years ago and the way that photosynthetic algaes ultimately created something like the first industrial pollution catastrophe mm -hmm. and and that it, it was because of the emergence of a glycolytic metabolism this metabolism that could actually mm -hmm. fold oxygen back into a you know a looped process that we have this beautiful balance between the exhalations of plants and animals that we have now and that we take for granted as sort of the natural order yeah you know so I don't know. I guess I'm curious to know. I don't. A, I mean, that's a valid point, yeah. and I totally agree. And yes, that was the first mass extinction event was was life producing oxygen, which was very toxic and very bad news for those early bacteria and archaea. But but I still I still stand by the point that we are we are a, an insane species by by quite a few metrics in terms of our, our wanton destruction of our our, our ignorance and our, our power. Of, and, and ignorance like being very powerful and very ignorant is a really really dangerous combination i don't know of any other species that behaves as we do and is so out of out of sync with with living systems i mean i guess yeah. other things are always bound by living systems uh, we have the power to sort of influence living systems which has both good and bad sides surely so it's the power the power that i think is what i'm getting at here and and i think you know I, I remember years ago i participated in this thing at synergia ranch where dennis mckenna said as i'm sure he said many times elsewhere that he wanted to insist on all world leaders drinking ayahuasca that that would that would be sort of like a, a necessary rite of passage you know mm. and, and you know to the extent that it is like people want to talk about human civilization as a cancer which i see an increasing number of scientists comfortable with you know stepping out and mm. saying saying exactly this from a metabolic view of cancer cancer is a way that's mm. like, it's something that it's, it's it's cheated its way into finding resources that it, it doesn't have the wisdom to properly distribute mm. right mm. so this it's a matter of like power erupting in one time scale and sort of one or you know like the, like you said sophie uh, space time mattering one order of space time mattering and so yeah i don't know i just like this bundle of of stuff around what it is that we're capable of actually understanding the downward causal pressure of our society and its constraints and and our cognitive and attentional constraints and you know what it is on a daily basis we're actually capable of you know our limits like I, I guess what i'm asking is is to like feel into the compassion for the sort of realistic scope of an ecodelic global initiative because frankly most of us are just trying to keep our heads above water oh and, yeah totally, you know totally totally like no i so, i, I that's that's yeah totally valid and like you know if we were to have a glo an ecodelic global initiative like i mean it'd be it'd be great if we could pull that off as a civilization but it's the our disconnect from nature is i think that it's the root of the environmental crisis that we find ourselves in it's that psychological disconnection and there's no way psychedelics alone are, are no way near enough to to push back against that like yes i'm involved with research showing them that they have this really interesting special capacity to to facilitate this reconnection to nature and it seems to be sustained it seems to happen after a single experience and most interestingly of all you can kind of give someone a dose of psilocybin say in a completely clinical setting without any any nature allowed in there and and people will still have this this sort of complete 
shift in how they relate to the wider environment and to nature and it really stays with people but we're going to it's going to be it's, the scale of the problem is so vast that it, it will take top down and bottom up change it will take like education it will take biophilic design urban urban greening like redesigning us our, our urban environments you know three quarters of all people are going to live in cities by uh 2050 according to the un so we need people shouldn't have to leave the, the city to go out and experience nature it should be part of of human habitation we should be li living alongside um, nature we need to be getting our kids into nature you know they've got like what's been called nature deficit disorder we need to have nature-based education we need to like there's a huge inequality in the in, in the access to nature at least here in the uk and over much of the world and we really need to to address that it's all very well preaching go out into nature and connect with it but if you've not got any nature in your vicinity to do that it's it's not so easy so we need to think about ways of sort of yeah working on this issue on multiple fronts i feel sophie I have a lot of thoughts. One, I really want to problematize this false category of the human because I think that's part of the psychological um, disease that, that we've created. And the fact is, I mean, something I've thought a lot about is so the rise of civilization, sessile communities where you start changing your environment, monoculture can be called human, but you can also map that onto the rise of fermentation. Maybe yeasts are telling this story. So I think it's always important for us to realize that we might not be the authors of this story or the sole authors and that in fact author authorship is interactive and i so and also yeah okay so greenery we don't have nature a lot of people live in cities a lot of people live at a distance from quote unquote fetishized nature we are we have more bacterial cells in our body than we do human cells so for me what i really want to try and do is problematize all of these categories we've created that actually create this false sense of disconnection. That your very gut, you know, the shit that you excrete every single day. I mean, I'm really interested in the contaminated, complicated rebel ecologies that we've created right now. We are not going to be able to create an ideal utopia where we have an ecodelic shift and everybody gets with the program and things are beautiful again we are going to have to be in a salvage state. We are gonna to have to be agile as things get chaotic. Nature is gonna come inside. I mean, coronavirus is nature. Coronavirus is everywhere. So people who haven't experienced nature, you're experiencing it right now, your whole life is infringed upon and prickled by this experience. Nature is very often invisible. I mean, I'm a big proponent of the smalls, like fungi and viruses and bacteria. And for me, I think that's an incredible way to start realizing that there is a interpenetrative experience of nature that is happening every time you take a breath. And I think, I think we need new stories with new ways of telling that complicate and trouble our anthropocentric ways of saying we are, we are at a distance or that we're the only ones telling the story. Yeah, our civilization is killing everything, but I don't know if it's our civilization. We are thinking on a very small scale Rich, do you have? Yeah, no, it's just beautiful to listen. Uh, you know, I don't know, 14 years, 15 years after that word came through me and to listen to where it's going. And I just like, it makes me uh, really happy and with joy because I agree, first of all, Sam, that we have to move beyond the conceptual recognition of the ecosystemic jam that we're in and that we've got to have that uh, direct experience. So the, the research you're telling us about is awfully good news. And I honestly asked without snark in 2006, will a humble cactus be the answer to a global ecosystemic catastrophe? And when we frame it in the context of the uh, great oxygen poisoning, then we can say, well, why the frack not actually? Uh, if it's a, a tiny shift in the operation of bacteria that allow us to start, you know, dealing with that oxygen. To me, what I've located the proximate, uh, the, the local and uh, proximate cause of what we're talking about here, which I agree with Sophie is not necessarily human. It's the uh, level of egoic practice that is engaged in on a daily basis. In other words, when Nietzsche said that humans were a skin disease upon the earth back in 
the late 19th century, well, well anticipating the uh, cancer uh, diagnosis that would come uh, over 100 years later, he was saying that precisely as we kind of have replicated as these beings that experience themselves, and again, I'm agreeing again with Sophie and Sam, that experience themselves as somehow impossibly separate. And so all of the practices, it seems to me, that can come from top down, but I'm mostly interested in the bottom up practices because the top down practices seem to breed the very egoic beings that we're trying to sort of unravel. Bottom up practices of Ecodelics plus, meaning both the ecodelic paradigm. I like Sam's way of saying, hey, how ecodelic are you? That's very kind of Marshall McLuhan, you know, saying like, I, I like that a lot where people are going to start to feel a sort of sense of wrongness if they realize that they've fallen out of an ecodelic space, not in a judgy way, just like they're out of kilter, they're out of uh, alignment. But that also it has to be ecodelics Plus, because what I have observed is that even if one dose of uh, psilocybin can, this is good news, can alter one's ecodelic perspective, the very infrastructure that we live on on a planetary basis itself enforces this subject-object conception of a quote-unquote human reality. And so therefore, barring a radical large-scale transformation of that infrastructure from the top down, we need to, it needs to be an inside job, right? The great second <laughs> William S. Burroughs said, the only way out is in, and that um, we can take the clue from the mushroom to, strangely enough, dive inside in order to discover our continuity with all living systems. And experientially, the re reason that that introspection or interception creates that continuity is because we come to experience, as Sam was saying, that that boundary between inside and outside isn't, right? That we discover that we are interbeings that live in between whiles, which is really a word. Um, but that that has to be, in my humble experience, an everyday practice. In other words, that the work we're engaged in has to be tuned to that as an everyday practice. Our self-care has to be tuned to that as an everyday practice. And as I have found that ecodelics are neither necessary nor sufficient actually to achieve this state, that we have to pair ecodelic inquiry with practices of contemplation, meditation, dance, music, other acts of creation, all of which can serve to unravel that egoic clench that I think we're all describing. We're describing the, the fact that we're kind of somehow find ourselves birthed into this world where we're compulsorily cleft from uh, the ecosystemic interconnections that make us up. And that even if we experience and glimpse and can never unsee the falsehood of that, that we have to build the deconstruction of those binaries that Sophie is rightly talking about into the very infrastructure of our everyday life. And I would humbly submit that the bicycle is one of those technologies <laughs> that can allow you to integrate that into your everyday life because it is the capsule of the solo vehicle or even the cigar-shaped tube of metal hurtling through space or the, the bus, you know, these things are all built on this premise of our kind of radical experiential separation. Now, of course, as so Sophie is uh, pointing out, that separation's bluff has been called because one of the things we can experience in the pandemic is that we're all soaking in it, right? Like it's all one continuum of life. So, I, I love everybody's optimism and I and I love Sam's idea of both the top down and bottom up. But right now where I'm focusing my efforts is entirely on the bottom up efforts of teaching people that they can grow they can grow psilocybin mushrooms in their closet. They can <laughs> <laughs> they can think uh, well and critically and lovingly about how to how to learn from those mushrooms and they can learn that they should start small with them and meditate lots, right? 
Uh, and we can still learn immense amounts from cannabis too, which by the way, I include rather controversially, perhaps as an ecodelic in the original treatment of Darwin's Farming, precisely because it is quite conducive to the withering of the experience of the corporeal boundary uh, within any kind of ecosystemic context. So that's just a long riff on agreeing with every wonderful thing that Sam and Sophie both said, but I remain actually really perhaps improbably optimistic that the top-down distribution of techniques for ego death, which are the condition of any perception of ecology whatsoever, can do just as good at a job transforming the earth as the bacteria did two billion years ago. But that because we give so little credit to consciousness, particularly the Gnostic form of consciousness, Sophie, that allows us to turn our consciousness back onto ourselves, that we think, ah, that could never work. We need some special molecule or magic bullet or something. But if ego death goes viral, as it were, look out, right? We're going to transform the infrastructure to be green and conducive to these non-dual states. Ole. So I want to turn our attention to the Marshall McLuhan invisible environment in which we're all having this conversation, right? Which, or, or rather this, this discussion is sprouting like a mushroom out of what the mycelium of the internet itself, which I think at this point should be obvious to most people is having an ecodelic influence on the nature and structure of the modern mind, you know, the modern mind that grew up, at least me as an elder millennial, like I, I you know, I grew up not immersed in this hyper-connected thing in quite such an acute and present and imminent way. And here we are now, and it's only it's only getting more so. And so, you know, Rich, one of the things that I feel your work helped solve for me was about this question about if the ego in its current formulation constitution is kind of like an auxiliary generator, you know, a, a backup system that came online as part of, you know, our undivided experience was sort of compressed in the context of reciprocal dynamic relationships in society. And, oh, and we became, yeah, we became like, uh, you know, to borrow from the work of Jessica Flack at the Santa Fe Institute, who looks at the way that an entire social system is coarse graining, uh, it's aggregating information from individuals and then exerting this pressure on us. So the social contract is actually this intermediating layer between all of us. Like we actually have kind of more, more of a relationship with society as human beings than we do to one another in some respects. And yet that thing, which arguably was responsible for the emergence of syntax. And therefore I, you know, I want to just note Clifton Ross's question to you, Rich, in the comments that isn't the subject object relation written into grammar. And, and so the internet seems to be gesturing towards the necessity, not only for a more convoluted self other boundary in our phenomenal experience, but also in the way that we communicate this, like it, that it gave us in some sense, the, you know, the, the social internet of a clan gave us the self as we understand it. And now it's, it's asking for us to move past that into something more, you know, non-Euclidean, which by the way, folks, all of this stuff is this evolutionary arguments written into Darwin's pharmacy into, into Richard's book, which I can't recommend enough. And I, I seem not to be able to stop recommending, but it looks like what we're being called to do here is in part to actually render the real lived complexity of our experience in the 21st century. And it's sort of like Deleuze guitar and webbedness into a new language, into a new way of communicating our experience with one another. And I'm curious, we, this may be all we have time for, and then we can take this conversation into the the uh, you know virtual hangout in Ozo afterwards, but I'm curious to know what all of your thoughts are on how it is that we actually turn into the swerve, right? Like we actually go into the burning building of samsara here and actually embrace in kind of a tantric way the problematic language that we use to talk about this, and and how do we enrich it 
in a way that actually does justice to this. In the same way that, Sam, you were talking about earlier about bringing nature back into the city. How do we sort of move past the Athenian walled city nature paranoia of subject verb object syntax Mm -hmm. and and like deepen into a language that to uh, pay a nod to xenolinguistics and Diana Reed Slattery, you know, is actually capable of not capturing per se, but it's my two-year-old <laughs> banging on the door is always with the ruptures yes i'll end it there you know what i'm saying yeah Anyone? well i'll just i'll just maybe say quickly i just uh, just a quick thing and I, don't, I think it's partly related to what you're saying here but I, f- I feel like yeah we do need to be really careful with the language that we use here to talk about this stuff because you don't want to seed further disconnection you don't want to present humans as something that are separate that you know well i mean as i've been discussing like humans are something separate from nature that need to get back in touch with nature because you're kind of sowing the seeds of further disconnection there but at the same time you need to be also brave about acknowledging that there is a great systemic disconnection human physiology and psychology reacts very differently to frenetic urban environments that lack non-human life than than sort of more nature-rich um environments i mean that's just there's a huge there's a good body of of science on that so yes we need to be careful and tender with the language we use but we also need to be courageous and direct and accurate but uh, yeah that's i'll let other peeps jump in there can i say something i really like the the cutting to the fact that to say something courageous is more important than to perseverate over how to perfectly say something. You know, something I always say to my writing students and to people I'm talking to is storytelling is an emergency. Changing the narrative is an emergency. If we think too long, we're not even going to exist to say the words. So yeah, I think just coming from a heart-centered place, knowing that we are we have faulty language, we have faulty bodies, we can never properly say what we want to say, but we must say what we care about. I mean, I really think this sounds so silly, but I think it's the truest thing I know. And as someone who's experienced a couple of serious NDAs and come through the bottleneck of those, this is the only thing that comes with you. Just care about what you love and and speak from that spot, speak for the beings that you are drawn to. Each person is gonna be drawn to a different being. I mean, I went to school for semiotics and for language philosophy, and I think it's bullshit. I do not think it saves you when you are getting electrocuted in an ambulance. And that is kind of metaphorically where we are as a civilization. Um, So right now, the language has to be the distance between what we really care about and what we are saying has to be short, which means that the language may necessarily be very clumsy. So I actually think, weirdly enough, this is a time for extraordinarily clumsy language. We are on the phone from the plane that's about to crash. We have to say exactly what we mean. And by say exactly what I mean, I mean like just say what you care about. Michael, I wanted to follow up on that uh, excellent treatment there of Sophie's to respond to this idea that a subject object is built into the grammar by pointing out as in a way, so Sophie just did about the, the analogy of the plane is about to crash, that there is syntax. Yes. Subject object are born in syntax, but there's also semantics and pragmatic semantics presupposes the existence of this non-dual state of meaning and pragmatics induces that experience of dissolution of the boundary between inside and outside. So even though the the I likely came into being 75 to 100,000 years ago as a uh, linguistic construct that we then fell for and it accelerated and went on a runaway process starting somewhere around the time of the scientific revolution where we believed we could somehow separate ourselves from our object of study and has gone into total hyperdrive and perhaps like the last maybe even 18 months We nonetheless have that birthright that both Sam and uh, Sophie spoke about, which is that ecodelic birthright that we know to be the truth, that to know what what we really are, are not an I. Whatever an I is, that's not all we are. And so the more we can just share the experience of beautiful, sublime and healing and beyond safe spaces, beyond the I, then it seems to me those spaces are going to become contagious in the same way that the eye became contagious and 
went on a, a runaway process. But the eye itself is no longer sustainable, I would suggest. Looks like Sophie has a question in the uh, question and answer. And then there's another mm -hmm. question also. I don't have a question. Who does? Uh, yeah, no, 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 no. Al Alberto and, and Sarah have questions in the Q&A if you want to pop those. Sarah, the book is The Alphabet versus the Goddess. Oh, yeah. that's a good book. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And then Al Alberto had a question for Sophie about the work on Gnosticism. What is the question precisely? The question was, care to tell us more about your work on Gnosticism? I have a ecological feminist reimagining of the Gospels coming out in 2023. So it's kind of the ecological reimagining of Rabbi Yeshua. It will probably get me killed. <laughs> and um, I also have another book coming out that are, it's kind of rewilding myths with ecology. And it goes back through, you know, Acteon, Dionysus, pre-Olympic gods. So yeah, that's also another book. And that comes out in 2022 in the spring. And then Sarah's question, what do you think has been the impact of losing oral tradition, or the telling of stories, the role of this in our brains and societies, and, and, and how do we reclaim that in Ecodelia? I'm not sure that we've really lost it, but I don't know. What, you, what do you all think? Um, I think you're right. We haven't lost it. It has atrophied. Uh, like I watch it, I, you know, because I, I, like Sophie, I teach writing. and um, But what I think is really interesting is that you begin, the, the big moment you begin to teach that listening is actually a kind of uncanny activity that is both active and passive at the same time and you can do it with more and less depth and intensity we quickly study up as it were michael and become better at it and better at it and better at it but i do think that, that sarah is correct that we've allowed the sort of apparent separation of writing and literacy to sort of separate us from the sort of more analog continuity of orality right Whereas orality has drift built, built into it mercifully, but writing is kind of an attempt to arrest that drift and narrow the swerve in your language. So, but, I, but like you, I said, it's, it's easily and beautifully reconstituted, but we have to actually illuminate that listening is a thing, right? Yeah. I really want to recommend to anyone who wants to learn more about this, the book on um, the lost art of scripture by Karen Armstrong, which I think is a more scholarly version of the alphabet and the goddess. Like the alphabet and the goddess is a great thought experiment. <laughs> and then the lost art of uh, scripture is like the bibliography. Um, I think that oral culture allows it, it, it reminds me of mushrooms and fungi, which is you have that underground mycorrhizal system that fruits up in a very adapted, ecologically situated way, but then melts back down into the ground. And so stories that are oral can adapt and can change to oh. shifting social and ecological and climatological conditions. But when you write something down, it doesn't change, it doesn't adapt, so it stops being nourishing. It ossifies and it breaks down. So I think when we rely solely on written culture, our stories stop being helpful or ecologically informative really, really quickly. Just in 30 seconds, I just want to nod to that particular thing because I do think that that's changing under the influence of hypertextual communication. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things I was just talking about on the in-house email list with folks at the Santa Fe Institute was the possibility of, based on a, a recent talk by uh, neuroscientist Stuart Firestein at, at Columbia, who came and gave a talk on optimism in uncertainty, the question of how do we actually render uncertainty you know people think that scientists are actually communicating something that they like they know that it's like this is a ground truth and often that's just distorted through the information loss of communication or the demands of the urgency of a moment you know like truman's question how can i find a scientist with just one hand you know because scientists are always saying on the other hand so how do we actually restore this in in our you know how do we restore fundamental uncertainty to the written word. And one of the things that I, I saw Seth Godin comment on recently was the possibility of using blurred text, like dynamic text that renders the confidence intervals of a claim in some sort of visual way that actually like latches into our, you know, like the way that we think about something. So, that, you know, maybe you'd come back and it's already the case that there's lots of slippage online. A link is broken or it leads to a different page. And so how do we rather than trying to treat the digital milieu as something that is this immutable record 
just like accept its metamorphic quality and and embrace that and use it to to communicate this epistemic humility and the ability for us to change our minds. I don't know, Sam, you want to you want to take the last word here? Um no, actually, no, I'll I'll put that back out to my fellow panelists if that's cool. Maybe we make the last word be humility since that's what Sam just demonstrated. <laughs> yeah. Right, in other yeah, words, no, that that is important. Um, humans, actually, yes, humans in general. Definitely, I'd like to see more of it in the psychedelic movement as well, <laughs> and just across our species. More freaking humility. We need more humility. Definitely. <laughs> Blessed are the meek. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, that's beautiful. I want this to be like three hours longer than it than it was, and I hope that we get time to do this with each of you on the show here individually and that I get a sort of a, the opportunity to commune. And thanks everybody for commenting in the, in the chat. This is a beautiful sidebar that I will make sure to include in our show notes for this, this episode when it comes out and thanks Daniel. And, and we'll see you all in the Ozo, I guess, if you want to keep this going, I, I but if you don't, so how do we, um, do yeah, I, is there I, a, a link to that? Just because um, I'm yeah, happy to we'll, keep chatting. But I cool. think we'll, we'll, I'll toss that in the. Okay, cool. Right that here. looks like it's there. Yes. Cool. Join the virtual thing. Thank you, Michael. Thank you to Daniel. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Sam. It's really beautiful. Likewise. Thank you. Yeah, thank thanks, you. guys. Yeah, nice, interesting, eclectic. Yeah. Let's see us in the news, though. See you soon. Thank hmm. you, to everybody. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you got as much out of that as I did. We actually carried the conversation on in a strange virtual reality after party for quite a while. I can imagine you feeling similarly unsatiated. And if that's the case, then once again, pop into the Future Fossils Facebook group or Discord server and uh, meet the other freaks that want to talk about this stuff with you. Just a quick teaser that we have some truly excellent stuff on the plate for the next couple months of Future Fossils. Subscribe and stay tuned for conversations with Chris Ryan, host of Tangentially Speaking and author of Civilized to Death, as well as Siv Watkins, the founder of microanimism.com. And three, count them, three amazing panel discussions moderated for Complexity Weekend, including the next live panel you will be able to catch for free on the weekend of November 12th, plus additional patrons-only episodes. And I am preparing to release the first set of Future Fossils NFTs. So yeah, stay in touch. Have a great week. Find me on Twitter or Instagram at Michael Garfield if you want to reach out. And with that, I will close with one of my favorite quotes from Richard Doyle's book, Darwin's Pharmacy. Note that the flower, with its multiple and layered invocation, a figure ground dissolution of inside outside that works as a snare for insect attraction, the now self-referential book, and the jewel share a vocation, organized and thoroughly seductive fluctuation.